So a few weeks ago, I was part of a leadership team that took 25 people on a guided hike through the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes Wilderness Area. And we took them on about a four, four and a half hour hike up to the lookoff overlooking Fox Lake. And it was a beautiful day, yet it was very cold. So we decided it would be really nice if we could put up a comfort station. So one of the other guys and myself, we got together and we'd created a comfort station where we heated water for hot, for hot chocolate and tea. And it worked out pretty good. But it got me thinking that I think we could come up with something that would work even better. If you're interested in seeing what I came up with, stay tuned. Okay, before I show you the solution, or at least the idea I've come up with, because it's still an untested idea, we're actually going to test it out today. Let me show you what we were using. So first, my setup. I took my firebox stove, my Gen 2 firebox. This has always proven to be an extremely strong performer, especially out in the wintertime. It's just the volume of this thing creates a hot, intense fire. Along with that, I took a 20 cup uh, percolator, aluminum percolator. And of course, without the, the insides, it was just for boiling water with. So that's what I took. And the other guy that I was with, took along a stove just like this. This is one of the small Coleman Peak stoves, white gas stoves, and he also had one of the 20 cup percolators that he could use for hot water. Now here's what's really interesting. We both started up at the same time. I had gathered up enough wood for the fire to, to uh, bring my water to a boil. He lit up his gas stove. The firebox brought my, the water to a boil in less than half the time, the white gas stove. And, and I wouldn't have believed it, and he didn't believe it either. But the heat that was generated by the firebox was intense enough that I could bring my water to a boil, give him my pot, take his pot, and bring his water to a boil before it even brought the other pot back to a boil. I'm telling you, these things put out a lot of heat. So that was what we used, and it did work out, but we didn't have quite enough water to have every cup of uh, coffee or tea, not coffee, sorry, hot chocolate or tea for everybody. So we had to be adding water constantly to bring it back up to temperature. And I thought I wanted something that would be all in one, much larger volume, something that I could have enough hot water all at the same time for everybody. Now, let me show you what I came up with. Okay, so this is what I came up with. This is a stock pot strainer. So this would drop down inside of a stock pot if you're cooking, I guess, spaghetti or if you're cooking anything else that you wanted to remove from the stock and have the stock separately. This would drop down inside of that pot. Then you'd be able to lift this out, let it drain and set it aside. Look at it. It looks like a giant IKEA utensil strainer. It looks like it would make the perfect hobo stove. So that's what I thought when I saw it. And I decided to pick it up for two or three dollars at Value Village, the thrift shop in my area, and brought it home. Now, I looked at it and thought, how am I going to use this? Well, this, in my mind, had to be a simple DIY project. And the reason I wanted to make it simple, because that is the hallmark of a good DIY project. At least one that I want to share with you. It has to be something that is available, that you don't have to spend a lot of money on, and that takes minimal tools, if any tools, to put it together and put it into effective use. So right now, I have used absolutely no tools to make this an effective stove. I may yet make modifications to it, and I'm actually going to open it up and ask for your suggestions as well. But let me show you what I've done to make this usable as is. Okay, to start with, I wanted to raise it off the ground a little bit. I wanted to give it a little bit of height and at the same time see if I can't give it some stability. So what I put on it... These are, and I'll give you a close-up, these are conduit clamps used for attaching conduit to a wall or anything else. I have some simple bolts holding them onto the bottom right through the existing holes. I may replace the nuts, the uh, regular hex nuts that I have, I may replace them yet with wing nuts to make it a little easy, but so far they're, they're not loosening up. And these are the one inch size uh, conduit clamps. So they provide me with a couple of things. One, they give me the clearance off of the ground. So a one inch clearance off of the ground. They also extend out past the outside of the strainer so that I've got some extra stability. And the fact that they are rounded means that when I put them inside of a bag of any kind, either it's directly in my backpack, although I do have a large size stuff sack, which I'll show you in a few minutes, they're not going to cut through the material. So they work extremely effectively as feet for this on the ground. Here's what they look like. I'll give you this close up. 
This is the one inch size. This is the only thing that I had to purchase at full retail value. And I got these at Home Depot for anybody that is interested. I think the value of this was $3.99. I could be wrong. I'll change if it is uh, more expensive than that. There was five in the bag, so I had one spare for a future project, I guess. So that is how I got the thing to sit up off the ground. What else did I need? Well, to make this a complete system, I needed a pot. Also purchased at Value Village. This is a six liter compost pot. They are sold through Lee Valley here in Halifax and across Canada, and I'm not sure if they're available across the state. I'm sure there's something similar. Six liter stainless steel pot. And yes, I did sterilize it, don't worry about that. So this makes a huge pot of water to put six liters in there, and it drops down inside nicely. So it wasn't perfect the way it is, but I'll show you what I had to do to make this usable. But this is quite compact now then that I can get both of them together. By the way, these stainless steel pots are available in two sizes, and I was able to pick up both of them for a couple of dollars. Six liters and four liters. So if you're looking at something a bit smaller, or want something a bit smaller, this is the four liter version and the six liter version. All right, let me show you what I had to do to the pot to make it effective. So as you'll notice, there's no way for the keep the bale upright. Now that's okay if you're suspending this over an open fire, because then you can use a big toggle to hold it up. But there was no way that I could use this over, over top of the stove, and I'll show you how I'm going to support it over the stove in a second. I could over the stove and not have the handle fall down and then potentially get very hot and, you know, the, the risk of a burn. Even with the gloves, these things can get very hot. So I wanted some way of putting, having this stand upright. I fooled around with some wire, trying to make some kind of a clip that would be something like that you might get on the new zebra pots sold by the firebox stove. I couldn't come up with anything that was looked like it would work successfully there. But then the answer came to me quite easily. One of the other things I needed was some way of lifting the lid off without reaching in and grabbing the, uh, the little knob, because as you can see, the knob is recessed on this. Well, I had to have a piece of paracord nearby. I just tied a fisherman knot on it, which opens up and closed up around the top of that knob. And now I have a means of lifting the lid off, either with my finger or with a stick if, I want to, if I'm reaching in over an open fire. Turns out that this little loop, and this loop may not be the final size that I, I leave it at. This is just uh, where I have it at right now. Turns out that loop is going to serve a dual purpose. So let me pick up. I have a stick. This will not be the stick I'll be using. It's just one I had here at home right now. And what's interesting is if I put the stick through the loop, the handle now sits upright. Now you can see I have some adjustments to do. I don't want it too upright because then it's likely to fall over. But I have some adjustments to do to uh, keep it in just the right position I want it. So the stick has to be about 10 or 12 inches in order for this to work. So I can either grab one I'm on the trail or I can take one with me. I'm not sure which, which I'll do at this point. The other benefit of having a stick with you, of course, is that you need a good size stick. If you look at this bale, you need a good size stick in order for that to work. So I would have a clove hitch or some other knot around the center of the stick, run it through, as if there was a rope on it, and then I could use the stick for, for holding this over an open fire. Of course, again, that can be made very quickly on the trail. So here's the two-part system that I have so far, and as I mentioned now, I needed some way of suspending the pot over the fire. Well, the simplest thing was to grab this also at Value Village. This is a 10-inch cake pan. So this would be what you put in your counter when you take a cake or cookies or anything else out of the oven and you want to cool it off. This is a cooling rack. Just happens to fit perfectly inside the top of the pot strainer or the uh, stock pot strainer. Now, I look at this, and yes, it'll work to support the pot above the fire. Uh, it has two challenges. One is I would have to take this out if I wanted to refuel, put more sticks in. Okay, that's not a big deal. A little stick will help me take that out. I should be able to reach in, even with a pair of gloves. Of course, it would be a lot of flame, so I'd probably use a stick of some type to lift it out. The other thing is this is very, very thin wire. It's not intended to stand up to heat. Ideally, I would use a much heavier gauge rack, and you can get them. I just don't want to pay per full price for it, but a 10 inch barbecue grill will also fit inside of there because it's a perfect fit for anything that's 10 inch in diameter. 
I'm not going to pay full price if I find one on sale or if I can find one at Value Village or one of the other thrift stores, that's what I'll do. So that's one option. This is the one I'm going to start with, but it's not the only option. Something else I picked up out there was a much heavier grill. This also fits on top and gives me a bit more uh, support for larger items. Also a nice grilling. So if I use charcoal or let my wood go down to coals, I have a nice heavyweight grill that I can use over the top of this. It's just going to be a little bit bigger to pack. It's also going to be a little easier to get off of the fire because the part of it will be extended out past the, the, uh, the top of the pot. One other thing that I found is this was picked up at Dollarama, one of our dollar stores in the area. This is just a triv that you might use for putting a kettle. I bought this for use with a uh, Dutch oven that I have that I also picked up at Value Village. It didn't have feet on it, but I wanted something that I could lay in coal. So that's the purpose I bought this. You can see it's brand new. I haven't used it for that purpose yet. But lo and behold, it also sits in perfectly and gives me a little bit more height above the flame if I want that. And also gives me places where I can feed more wood in or invert it and it sets in just below the surface and there are some advantages to that yes I'm taking a little bit of the volume away from from the fire and the wood inside of that but this is huge this is going to be a big fire to start with but it does give it a little bit of a windscreen around the outside so with the pot sitting on top of this it's just below the surface provides a little bit of a windscreen brings it a little bit closer to the fire I'm not sure which one I'll use yet I'm probably going to start it with the 10 inch one and uh, we'll see how that works out I may end up using this I like the packability of the smaller ones another option and this is something I'm sure somebody will recommend and it is a good option is that I drill holes at different heights and then run two heavier gauge maybe eighth inch pieces of iron bar through or make just one long uh, u-shaped one that i can run through and set the pot on at different heights if i want that will allow me to put a pot in and uh, feed wood all around it i may yet do that i just wanted to start off with no drilling no tools whatsoever so that is the setup i have now the only thing left to do is to get out and test this out, outside so let's do that oh just one thing before i do let me put that aside those little conduit clamps this is another one of my project Ikea hobo stoves, so they're made from the Ikea utensil strainer, and I know somebody's going to pick me up on how I'm pronouncing Ikea. Go ahead, I don't mind. This is the way I pronounce it. But this is a two-part system. This also comes from I Ikea, and uh, it makes a perfect fit for a hobo stove. Um, the conduit clamps work on these. These are the smaller one-half inch conduit clamps. So I get added stability, I get height off of the ground, and I get a rounded surface so that when it's folded away, it's not going to tear into any stuff sack I made. So you can purchase those for that project as well. All right, let's get outside and put this stove into action. So there's a reason why I'm doing this test in my backyard today. Look at the size of this thing. And that's the reason right there. This is not something I'm going to drag into the woods just to do a test on. It's huge. And that's great too. I'm going to give you all the measurements, the weights and everything else. I'll put those in the show notes below and possibly on the screen as well of what this project turned out like. You may end up with something different, of course, depending on what you purchased to put something together like this. So once again, the purpose of this is for larger groups where I want to bring a lot of water to a boil or if I want to use it as a charcoal barbecue or a wood pellet stove, it's something that I can carry. Now, the nice thing about it is, even though it is big and bulky, it's not exceptionally heavy, that huge six liter pot inside will give me an opportunity to put a lot of my normal contents inside of this. That'll still fit inside my backpack. I just have to be efficient in the way I pack it. You'll notice that I have it in a stuff sack, really simple stuff sack, pillowcase purchased, you know, Value Village, just a couple of pillowcases that I washed. They make great stuff sacks for larger projects like this and some other projects I'll be bringing to you. Okay, I'm going to set this up on the ground. We'll get a fire going. We'll see how well it works with a pot of water. All right, seeing as how this is not a video on firecraft in the woods, I am going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to use a gas lighter, a little bit of my Hangar 51 fire strip roll, some birch bark, and some cut and split wood. So this is going to make a, quite a huge fire, but I do have quite a bit of firewood here to go with it. So the first thing I want to do, or the first thing I'm going to do anyway, is put a few pieces of wood inside, kind of create a place almost like a start, the starting of a uh, 
log cabin style fire. Just a place so that uh, I can put the birch bark and everything down inside of it without smothering it when I put the rest of the wood on. So I'll put most of that birch bark down inside. Some old dry birch bark. And I know I've shown this before. It's one of the things I like about the Hangar 51 stuff. Take out a little section of it. I'm going to fold some of it up because when you do that it burns a little slower and hold a bit of it out like a wick. And I'm going to light this and take it down the side. Lights up nicely. Maneuver it around a little bit. Just a bit birch bark lit. That's better. Put a few of these small sticks and of course it is going to be smoky like that from the birch bark. My splits could be smaller but they are what I have but I think I've got enough birch bark inside and this is really really dry wood. With a little luck We'll have a fire going in a few seconds. Bit of a teepee fire going on the inside right now. That's mostly haphazard. This is the way the wood's going in, but it should help it night a little faster. Yeah, there's airflow. Lots and lots of airflow all the way around the outside of that. Give that a few sec seconds to catch on, then I'll add some of my larger stuff. And once the fire seems to be a bit more established, we'll put the pot of water on and see how long it brings to, uh, brings to boil. Ooh, that's catching on fast. Alright, it's going to take a few minutes for the wood to catch and drop down inside there and that's when I'll bring it back and we'll put the water on. It's just not a speed test, this is just a general idea of how long would it take a, a stove like this to bring six liters of water to boil. And it's right now it's about minus five degrees Celsius, so just below freezing, not very cold. But uh, yeah, this should be fun. Now we do have a bit of a breeze as you can see, so well, that'll have an effect on it. I don't have a windscreen big enough unless I want to go get a piece of plywood or something. In the woods, I'd probably do this in a more sheltered area. But uh, wow, that's starting to generate heat. Okay, I'll bring it back in a few minutes when we're ready to throw the water on. All right, I think that's maybe ready to put my pot of water on. Six liters of water is pretty heavy. So here's the trick I was mentioning about having a stick. Kind of hold the pot off. Ooh, I can see an issue already, and that is that wire is not going to be strong enough to hold weight, especially under the fire. But there we go. Well, I guess I better get the timer started on this. And start. All right, we'll get an idea. I don't expect this to be any land speed record of any type. I'm already not happy with how the grate is holding in, up the, the pot, so I think that'll be the first and last time that grate gets used. Ooh, there's some heat coming off of that. Yeah, quite a bit of heat. I have to keep an eye on this now. I think uh, I'm a little uh, concerned about how much bending is taking place on that little uh, cake stand. Yeah, that'll be the... I won't be using that again. There is some wind, but it is starting to work. Alright, I'll bring it back when it comes to about boiling, unless something else happens along the way. So far, this thing is putting out a tremendous amount of heat. I don't think it'll take too long to bring six liters of... that's cold tap water. 
don't think it'll be too long before that comes to a boil. Okay, about four minutes into the test, I had to take the pot off the top of the fire. If you can see that or not, but that's the end of this cake rack. Uh, don't use a cake rack. That's my lesson learned. Use something much sturdier. So I grabbed the other rack that I had in the house. Bigger, but much sturdier. Let's see how that one does. So uh, I took the opportunity to add a few more sticks to the fire. This should be easier for me to grab and a hold of to take off if I need to add sticks to the fire. It's just a little larger than I wanted to carry. All right, the test continues. All right, folks, as you can hear, there's uh, my neighbor's dog is barking in the background. Hard rolling boil. I'm going to take that off. So that was clock time, five, or 18 minutes. But you have to remember, I had it off of the fire for three minutes while I went in and got the other grates. So 15 minutes to bring six liters of water to a boil in minus five degrees Celsius weather. Not too bad. All right, I would call that a successful first test with the exception of the cake stand that I put on top for a grill. This grill is working much better. I think it's a much more functional grill in any case. But uh, yeah, I would consider that successful. So I'm going to wait for a few minutes for this to cool down and then we'll wrap this video up. Okay, a few observations and some closing thoughts on this new supersize hobo stove. First off, we'll take the pot out and set it aside. The pot strainer itself withstood the heat admirably. It really did. There is no deformation, change colors obviously, but it hasn't buckled or melted or bended or anything else. So this is worked perfectly for the job intended. The fold out feet on the bottom worked perfectly. They withstood the weight of the, the wood full, uh, the stove full of wood as well as the pot full of water. So it worked well. One of the things I didn't mention before, which is kind of interesting, is there's two handles on either side. Now, while I wouldn't necessarily pick them up even with gloves on while there is a fire, I could use a couple of hook sticks to come underneath this and lift this whole thing and move it to another location if I had to. Speaking of locations, something interesting did happen. I had this sitting on a patio stone that I have out in my backyard just for doing tests like this, and there was enough heat generated coming down through the bottom of this to crack the patio stone. Now mind you, mind you, it was frozen, so but it would have warmed up slowly with the heat, but there was enough heat. What that tells me is, and it's nothing I, I, I don't think I wouldn't have realized anyway, is that the bottom of this, while it didn't let any ash or, or hot coals out, it did generate a lot of heat. Be sure of the surface you put it on out in the woods so that you don't generate enough heat to cause any duff or any uh, anything underneath smoldering that might later cause a forest fire. If you're a little concerned, you don't have a rock base or something else that you want to put it on, uh, you know, here's something else I picked up at Value Village. It's just a pan of subtype. I don't know if it's a cookie pan or it was out of something else, but I picked this up very inexpensive. I, it'll fit in the same bag with everything else, and I can lay this down on the ground and place this on top of that, and then I don't have to worry about that heat transfer into the ground underneath. So that was the observations. Where's that other piece of now garbage? There it is. Hold on. All right, as I mentioned outside, I don't use one of those thin little 10-inch cake uh, rest pans things that just completely bowed that that's it's now a piece of recycled garbage so that's fine this heavy duty one withstood the heat but I'll tell you there's still a little bit of bending taking place in a couple of the bars if you're going to build something like this and generate that much heat get something heavy duty ideally a barbecue grate which is intended to uh, to take that much heat so there are still a few ideas such as putting some heavy duty bars across the top of this, which I may do yet. I just like, as I said, I just wanted to do this without any modification to it. Okay, so those are my observations. What I want to do at this point is open it up to you. If you have any suggestions for what you might do with this differently, uh, how you might modify it yet to make it more effective, please leave them in the con comments below. I think it's fair to say that this will not be going with me very often in the woods because of the size of it, because of its intended purpose. It's a great car camping thing. It's something you might take as a base camp and set up if you want a nice contained fire at a base camp, or uh, the intent that I have for it is for taking for large groups, which, by the way, in two weeks time I will be part of a guided hike to take another large group out so I think I probably will take this along and give it a try the other thing I have left to do with it is try it with charcoal and of course wood pellets to see how they work in it all right so if you have any comments please leave them in the show notes below but until you see this thing in use again next time get out and explore and take that path less travel it'll make all the difference bye for now